Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. The rural area around Toronto's major highways is some of the more fertile land you'll find in Canada. And it is zoned that way. It's agricultural land with plenty of space for country homesteads or, as the city grows, townhouses and small communities. Oh, and trucks. Thousands of trucks rolling up and down these little roads all day and night, parking at one of the literally hundreds of illegal truck depots that are operating throughout this region. Some of those depots are right next to homes or farms. Others are located off in the country along tiny roads never intended for trucks. Almost every one of these depots is in clear violation of zoning laws. And this has been going on for years. And there is nothing, at least so far, that anyone has been able to do to stop them. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. David Ryder is a senior politics reporter at the Toronto Star who, along with his colleague, has been working on one of the uh, wildest stories I've heard in a while. David, how did you hear about this story? I had just finished kind of a deep dive on a city of Toronto issue, and I got uh, an email from a town councillor in Milton, which is in a suburb west of Toronto here, who said, you know, you did a great job on that. You got to come out and look at these illegal truck parking lots that are springing up everywhere in the 905 region and driving us all nuts. And I kind of wrote back and said, let's have a phone call. I don't understand. You can, how can you have an illegal giant truck parking lot as he described it? Um, And I ended up going out and he drove me around and showed me five of them in about 45 minutes all (laughs) around uh, the Highway 401 and Trafalgar Road in his town. And I think as a city resident, I know from experience that if your contractor screws up and builds your fence, you know, six inches higher than you're supposed to, you have the city on your doorstep, you're kind of facing a possible court thing, you've got to like cut the top of your fence off. (laughs) But in the region around Toronto, where trucking has boomed, people are setting up 10, 20 acre giant illicit parking lots for massive trucks and getting away with it for years. Okay, so before we get into uh, how that's possible, describe them for me. What do they look like? So on the tour he gave me, and I'll say there's all kinds because there's hundreds of these truck lots. uh, He showed me everything from where we would stop on the side of the highway and he would say, okay, look off in the distance. You see that farmhouse? And I'd say, yeah. He said, no, look left. And I would see a cluster of tractor trailer trucks parked beside. And he said, they're not part of the farm. The farm or whoever owns the adjacent land is renting out those spots. So it was pretty discreet. And then we had the total opposite. He drove me to a road called Auburn in Milton, kind of a main, but kind of a rural road. As we drove up, he said, notice the condition of the roads and both sides of the roads were completely crumbling to the point where it was obviously narrow that was supposed to be. And then we rolled up at these two lots, which had big gates, security booths, speed limit signs and trucks rolling in and out constantly. And he said, these are illegal lots. And I said, how can that be? I would drive by this and assume it's a normal business. And he said, this land is zoned agricultural and they're not allowed in any way, shape or form. And so where are these lots? And again, you mentioned there's hundreds of them, so we'll get to that in a minute. But just in relation to the community, you spoke to a woman, I believe, named Aisha Farouk Ahmad. What's been happening around her place? Yeah, Aisha lives in a subdivision of Brampton, you know, which is a a bustling suburb that was country and is now pretty much all suburb west of Toronto. Um, And she lives right on the border of Paladin, which is more rural, but is developing quickly. About 2017, there was essentially an empty kind of vacant rural lot across the street from her, which is in Caledon while she's in Brampton. She's right on the border. And all of a sudden, trucks started coming in with kind of fill to put down on the ground. And then they started parking there by the dozens. And she described watching people do like oil changes right on the ground, noise, obviously, dust, truck lights shining into their homes. And, you know, in normal situation, 
town planners or city planners are not supposed to put major industry like a, like a truck yard next to homeowners. So there is everything from that to the other extreme where it is really out in the countryside. Although I did talk to a woman who is way out the countryside in Milton who had her dream home out in the country and the same thing happened to her. So she huh. was in a rural area, not in a subdivision. And one of these lots set up and all of a sudden she said her, her dream was ruined. Okay, now give us a sense. You mentioned hundreds of these things of the scale here. Really hundreds and how many trucks and how long have they been operating? So our reporting, this is uh, myself and my colleague Noor Javed at the Star. The real uptick started around 2017 uh, when the lot opened across from Aisha. That's where you started seeing them. Politicians started noticing them and there were some news reports and some talk about how do we deal with these things. And then it boomed during the pandemic and the rise of e-commerce, which dramatically increased the number of trucks going along Highway 401 and the other 400 series highways around Toronto. So Amazon and all the things we've come to rely on, those goods have to be moved. Mississauga and Brampton, two of the cities west of Toronto, have become what they call logistics hubs. So there's distribution centers for a lot of those trucks. You know, there isn't room in downtown Toronto, even if that's where a lot of the packages are going. And then there's a, a huge population of truck drivers, some of whom work companies, some of whom have their own rigs and drive independently. They need somewhere to park the truck when they're not using it. So you had the confluence of the pandemic that helped accelerate already the trend towards online shopping. Mm-hmm. The other factor is that land in Mississauga and Brampton, where there are some legal truck lots, has just become extremely expensive because essentially most of it's being taken up for housing. And we all know there's a housing crunch and you need it and it's expensive. So then you have the rural areas farther afield that are also developing, but not quite where Brampton and Mississauga are, like Caledon and Milton, that are prime space for these truck lots to open up. Basically, the way it works is Often real estate agents, especially from Mississauga and Brampton, will look around for somebody who has a big property in one of these places and they'll say, you know, for five acres to 20 acres or maybe 25 acres max, we will give you six or seven million dollars, which you can imagine a lot of those people probably paid, you know, $100,000 for 50 acres back in the day. Right. Huge amount. And then they advertise and say, you know, future commercial opportunity Sometimes it's the real estate agent that actually opens up a truck lot. And then in other cases, they'll sell it to somebody who will then open up a lot. So it's a whole bunch of factors, but the numbers are verified by the municipalities. There's more than 200 just in Caledon. And then, you know, maybe another 100 in the smaller towns and villages around that. And there's sort of an accompanying problem, which is a little less visible, which is illegal wedding venues and party spots also being held on rural agricultural land. Really? But the truck is the one that's aggravating people the most. So how is this happening? How are these not shut down? Uh, What rules are they breaking and why haven't they just been closed if it's been going on for, what do you say, like seven years now since this started? Yeah, I guess it goes back to my thinking in, in the city where I live feels like you could never get away with something like this. Why Why can't you go out in the countryside? Right. Yeah, the fact is there are zoning laws and zoning rules that say if land is zoned R1 agricultural, you are only supposed to have farms on there. You can have a farmhouse. If you have a few trucks for your farm, that's fine, but you can't operate a business hosting other people's trucks. But municipalities, you know, it, it, it's not a criminal uh, law. They can't come in with sirens blaring and throw somebody in jail. So they have to go through a procedure, which is, you know, give them a ticket. And then if they disobey, take them to court. That procedure takes years. And with Aisha, she actually went to court. They did everything they could. The municipality went after them. In January of 2023, a judge issued an order saying the lot had to be cleared. They couldn't have a truck lot. And she said it went quiet for a while. And now they're back to dozens of trucks a day. So It's expensive for municipalities to prosecute these people. There's no kind of immediate effort that will shut them down. There also is a shortage of justice of the peace who generally hear these things and a delay in getting a court hearing. In Aisha's case, they did all of that. They got the order and it still hasn't been enforced. And at a recent Caledon council meeting, the city staff said, 
We have to go back to court to try to get the order enforced, but it's going to be until 2025 before we can get a court date. What do the municipalities themselves say about this problem and their inability to handle it? Like, ultimately, this is why we have municipal governments, right? Yeah. They say they're at their wits' end. They are worried about the environmental contamination of land that is potentially going to be homes at some point. Obviously, noise and aggravation for neighbors. There's also been an alarming number of fatal accidents on these rural roads involving tractor trailers. And you can imagine if it's a residence car hitting a tractor trailer, you can imagine who are the people dying. So they're at their wits' end, and they are uh, calling on the Premier Doug Ford provincial government, saying, we need more tools. That, yes, on paper, the fines are very high. We could go after them and maybe get a $50,000 or $100,000 fine. The reality is, it takes years to get to that point. Even if you get the fine issued, there's nothing that says they're going to comply with a shutdown order or even pay the fine immediately. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, these businesses, the reason they're willing to pay millions of dollars for 10 acres of, you know, property that looks like in the middle of nowhere is they're making that money back very quickly. Right. Our reporting said each truck is costing between $300 to $600 a month. And a lot of these lots have 100 or more trucks. Huh. So these guys are making a fortune. And essentially that any legal costs they have is essentially a cost of doing business and the fines, you know, maybe at the end of the day they'll pay it, but that's not going to put a dent in the massive profits they're making. So what is the provincial government doing about this then? I mean, this does sound like one of Doug Ford's uh, for the people issues that he could step in on here. I found the provincial response, frankly, quite puzzling. Sylvia Jones, who's deputy premier, uh, represents Caledon, one of the hardest hit areas. And there is a all party task force that is looking into the legal use of rural land. Their focus is a little more on the illegal party venues, but they are also looking at trucking. They held a hearing in August and they heard from the people of Caledon and the other municipalities. They got a response from the provincial government a couple of months ago that was essentially, you know, you have all these tools at your disposal, including these big fines, and we think you should use them. And the mayor of Caledon told us, if that was that simple, we would have shut these things down. Like we have tried everything going by the book and it's not working. And she told us, you know, she's kind of at her wit's end where she says, maybe we have to kind of play their game. Like maybe we start blocking the entrances, even if it's not technically legal, and then they can take us us to court while we take them to court. Hmm. We asked for a comment, obviously, from Ontario's housing minister, Paul Calandra, and they wouldn't give us an interview his office gave us a statement that was essentially kind of this kind of same kind of boilerplate that they gave to Kaladin in the summer, which is, you have a lot of tools, uh, now go use them. Why this area in particular? I mean, I know you mentioned it's close to the highways, but is it something about this area? Do we know if this is happening elsewhere in Canada close to major uh, highway nexuses? Yeah, I, I did when we were working on the story. I was curious about that, so I did kind of... Uh, search around a little bit. I found other spots that had some issues. Um, Obviously, it's one of those problems that could pop up anywhere. But it really seems that nowhere is suffering hundreds of illegal lots like this area west of Toronto. And I really think it is just Toronto is the fourth biggest city in North America. It's a huge market. And then there's the densely populated uh, suburban belt around it. The fact that Mississauga and Brampton have set up as these massive distribution centers And you have a huge population of truck drivers, as I said, many of whom own their own rigs and need somewhere. Essentially, what they want is, you know, they might be on the road for three or five or six days. Then they're home for a few days. They want to be able to park their rigs somewhere close to their suburban home where somebody can drive and drop them off and they don't have to worry about it. Right. So it really seems like it's a combination of uh, population and sort of the nexus of the trucking industry in this area that is making it such a huge problem. You tried to talk to or did talk to uh, the owners of some of these lots and asked them, you know, what do they have to say for themselves? Maybe walk us through one of those discussions with the one, uh, I think it was on Auburn Road that you spoke to. Yeah. And I will say these people, probably for obvious reasons, are not 
advertising that they own an illegal truck lot. Right. In some cases, we found they're they're quite prominent business people, and I think probably a lot of their you know friends and associates may be surprised. Anyway, most of these are owned by numbered companies, and then you have to start doing corporate searches and figure out who are the directors of those numbered companies. We did that for one of the Auburn Road properties, and I traced it down to a realtor in that area in Brampton, and he wouldn't talk to me on the phone. He sent me an email that said when he bought the property, he was assured by the previous owner that it had been acting as a commercial property previously, and it was grandfathered in and that he sent the appropriate documents to the municipality. So, of course, I go back to the municipality and they say that is absolutely not true, that this is A1 agricultural land. There's no provision for any kind of commercial activity on it. And they have no record of any grandfathering exception for that property or the one beside it, which is also like a pretty big bustling business. And then I believe you got accidentally CC'd on an email? (laughs) What happened there? This is the other interesting part of this. Yeah. So the neighboring property, I had also been in contact with the person who was listed as the director of the company. I was directed to a paralegal and the paralegal told me that, um, you know, your questions are are complicated and essentially some of these matters are before the courts. So we're not going to comment. And then shortly after that, I got an email from a development consultant, obviously working for the owner of the land, who I think thought he was responding to the paralegal, but in fact, accidentally sent it to me. And essentially, he was saying to the paralegal, you know, don't give the reporter any information that there are hundreds of these illegal truck lots all over this area, and we don't want to help him focus on ours. And they referred to it as an illegal truck lot in the email. He did, yes. Okay. So if there are hundreds of these illegal truck lots and, you know, you've explained already just how impossible it is to get rid of them, what could the government do here if they really wanted to crack down on these? So I think there's a few things. uh, We did talk to people who offered possible solutions. So there is this all-party committee, which seems, you know, legitimately interested in the issue. The trick is, I asked for a date for the report and there is no deadline. If Premier Ford calls an election at any time, all their work goes out the window, it would all have to start again, and there will be no report. Which is a real risk right now, I gather. A very real risk. Yeah, there's a lot of election talk in Ontario right now. So what the mayor of Caledon said, although the fines are high, she said the justice of the peace never give people the maximum. So make them even higher so that even if you're doing half of the maximum, it's potentially going to be $100,000 or more and will be something that might make somebody think twice about it. The other thing she said is that municipalities want the ability to essentially put sort of liens on the property because a lot of these properties are mortgaged. And if you start saying that there's essentially a financial penalty against the property, that could cause banking problems for them. It could potentially disrupt them and potentially dissuade others. The final one that I referenced earlier is barricading the properties. And that seems to be the one that essentially would provide some kind of immediate circuit breaker that would give people relief and maybe persuade the owner to, you know, pick up and go somewhere else or or go into another business. And people in Ontario might remember before marijuana was legal, there was these illegal cannabis shops that popped up and the provincial government gave local police the ability to drop concrete blocks or whatever they needed to do to barricade those businesses. Right. So the municipalities are saying, please give us that power. There have been some cases where municipalities have tried it and just sort of figured, you know, we're going to do it. And the owners have come and taken away the blocks and there's a bit of a cat and mouse game. But if you had the kind of power of the provincial government, and in some cases, you know, potentially police enforcing the barricading, I think that would send a real signal. At the end of the day, though, there is this massive demand to park trucks. And at the moment, not enough legal places to do it. Yeah. I talked to a guy named Mark Srega, who was in charge of bylaw enforcement for Caledon, retired last year. But he was the guy who for years had to grapple with this new problem. And he said, yes, do all those things, the barricade especially. But at the same time, municipalities have to kind of get their butts in gear and start zoning land and giving opportunity for legal lots where the ground is going to be properly prepared and you're not going to have oil and gas changes going straight into the soil, where they're going to have to pay 
commercial taxes to the municipality because agriculture taxes that these illegal lots are paying are a fraction of what they would pay if they were acting as a legitimate business. Um, you can have the Ministry of Transport go in, do the kind of normal sort of looks they're supposed to, the Ministry of Environment, have it act as, an, as a real business. Because the fact is, when I was going around with, the, the say, the councilor from Belton or talking to these other politicians, they know a lot of these rural and agricultural properties are going to get eventually turned into either homes or some kind of businesses. It might not be a truck lot. It might just be like a, you know, plaza or something like that. Right. Eventually they are, but this pressure is just building and people are just going in and doing it right away. Last question, just because I'm curious, if if these illegal lots are actually cracked down on and shut down, how would that impact like the supply chain and commerce in this gigantic area? As you mentioned, you know, there's uh, not enough places to park trucks legally right now. That's a great question. I, I don't know how you would model it, but yeah, you would have to think if if you could make, weigh the magic wand and, and a thousand concrete blocks fell in front of 300 or 350 illegal truck lots in the Toronto area, there would be some kind of impact on what many of us have come to see as a necessary thing of life, of being able to order something and have it appear in a day or at the most two or three. The trucks that are in the illegal lots are the ones that are rolling legally into Toronto and handing me my package and and everybody else in all the cities across Canada. I guess now we just see if those uh, concrete blocks materialize. David, thank you so much for walking us through this. Um, I had no idea this was going on. Me either. And I guess that's a great thing about my job. I get these calls and I think that can't be true. And then I find out it absolutely is. David Ryder, senior political reporter for the Toronto Star. That was The Big Story. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always shoot us some feedback. The way to do that is via email, hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca, or by calling us up at 416-935-5935 and leaving a message. We're available in all your favorite podcast players, and we're available on your smart speaker if you ask it to play the Big Story podcast, and we're available on our new app, Seeker, if you want to check it out. That's S-E-E-K-R. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.